David, I know it's hard to sort of come in and give all those numbers in a speech, and we're going to try and make those remarks available for everybody after uh, after the fact, as long as they um, we can get them and, and post them online, as well as some of the presentations you're going to see in this next panel. Uh, Good morning. I'm Sarah Ladislaw. I work in the Energy and National Security Program uh, here at CSIS. And I'm really excited about today's event, which is the second in a series that we're running this year uh, called the Opportunity Tipping Point. Um, and you can learn more about it on our website if you'd like. Uh, the first event had Jonathan Pershing talking about post-Copenhagen. Um, and today's event is, is not only to look at sort of the one-year anniversary of the DOE stimulus, uh, U.S. stimulus program, but also to uh, take a broader, a, a broader look at sort of global stimulus uh, efforts, global green stimulus efforts, and, and, and also uh, uh, see what's going on around the world, but also ask some critical questions about, um, as Frank had said, how do you sustain this uh, stimulus effort after the fact? Um, what have been the impacts? How are people spending this money differently? Has it been a success? How do you determine whether it's a success? Um, and I'm really excited about the panel we've been able to put together. Someone came up to me, uh, and I didn't pay them, or they don't work at CSIS, and said, you really have a star-studded panel today, and I completely agree. Um, as a nerdy researcher, these are the kind of people that uh, I want to hear from. Uh, and they've done some of the best, most comprehensive, most analytical work um, looking at questions of global green stimulus, how stimulus is being spent in different parts of the world, um, and how we all should view uh, uh, engage sort of the success of these programs. So um, without further ado, I'm going to get the panel started because we're a little bit running a little bit behind time. Um, what we're going to do today is um, everyone's going to present um, and then we're going to ask questions afterwards. So if you could hold your questions till the end, um, that would uh, be appreciated. And we're going to try and leave as much time for discussion uh, as I know there's a lot of knowledgeable folks out there who have some really good questions. So um, today on today's panel, we have uh, the great pleasure of having Nick Robbins, who's the head of the Climate Change Center at HSBC, who's done some of the most comprehensive work that I've seen um, to date on global green stimulus uh, spending. Um, we also have Ethan Zindler, who's the head of North American Research at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about the impact of stimulus spending on private sector activity, um, talk about some of the market dynamics in particular and what needs to happen post-stimulus. Um, we've got Julian Wong, who's a uh, senior policy analyst from energy, the Energy and Climate Change uh, Program at the Center for American Progress, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about what we can and uh, don't know about how China is implementing their stimulus program. Uh, and then finally, Kevin Book, who's the managing director uh, for research at Clearview Energy Partners, LLC, who's going to ask some of these really sort of uh, uh, analytical deep dive questions about how the stimulus uh, money is being spent um, and uh, places uh, for improvement uh, and, and things like that. So without further ado, uh, Nick. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, what I want to do is really um, highlight why a uh, international bank and investment research uh, company is interested in the green stimulus. For us last year, uh, we all knew that Copenhagen was happening. I think one of the surprises was the uh, green stimulus phenomenon. We expected uh, a nice big uh, international organization like the OECD to be doing international analysis of uh, the stimulus phenomenon. Uh, we found it wasn't, so that's why we uh, tried to do it ourselves. So I just really wanted to talk about sort of five points and uh, raise questions for discussion. I think the first and, and obvious point is, is, is normally uh, environmental agendas, environmental spending agendas get put on the back burner. This doesn't seem to have been to happen this time. Our estimates that about $513 billion uh, around the world has been allocated to uh, global green stimulus. I'll talk a bit about the definitions we use. This is about 15%, we think, of the fiscal stimulus. Uh, importantly, I think this is also aligned with some strategic uh, thinking, particularly coming out of East Asia, where we think about two-thirds of the green stimulus is, is allocated. This has had real imp impacts on actual investments. We've heard from David Sandelo and also investor confidence, and also some lessons about how to leverage private capital, uh, which is a very burning question in the, uh, the wake of the Copenhagen uh, summit uh, last year. 
On that, and as David Sandler, I think, highlighted, the international dimension has been a missing link. For, for obvious political reasons, stimulus packages have been internally and domestically focused. Uh, but one of the issues that we do need to think about is actually how we can also spend public money very effectively internationally to actually leverage uh, private, private capital. And then for us, as, as analysts looking ahead, obviously we have the stimulus phenomenon, but also is this, are we gonna, this going to be followed by a, a, a repeat of the sort of boom and bust period we've had in previous policy uh, rounds? Are we going to enter a realm of uh, green austerity as governments try to cut back spending, particularly in the industrialized world? So just to remind us about uh, why I think this is, this is important as, as, as an issue, um, the, the point of stimulus is to be uh, temporary, is to be targeted, and also to be timely. Uh, the question we've been asking is can this also be transformative, and why are the reasons whereby governments have been thinking about linking uh, the climate change environment, clean energy, and stimulus agenda? One, I think, is around the, the risk issue. I think we should not forget uh, the issues of systemic risk, and people, I think, have been aware of, of those issues. Uh, obviously, energy security, energy independence, the job agendas, as we heard, driving the next uh, round of productivity, uh, and also kick-starting the transition to a low-carbon economy. Just to underline, of course, that this is no substitute for long-term climate and clean energy strategy. This is supposed to be a temporary uh, measure. So how do we do our, our estimates? Uh, we use the investment themes designed by the HSBC Climate Change Index. This index has 18 investment themes, looks around the world at the 65,000 stocks that are listed on the world stock markets, and identifies those that actually do derive uh, revenues from climate change solutions in these four areas. Low carbon energy production, so renewables uh, and nuclear in particular, energy efficiency, energy management in buildings, transport uh, and industry. This would include grids, uh, water waste and pollution control, fairly self-evident, and then carbon finance, by far the smallest. Uh, just to underline our, our results, our estimates, uh, and one of the big issues, I think, for analysts is the, the lack of transparency in many country programs. Just to, to link this with some uh, uh, public opinion research that we've been doing, we've been doing this for three years now, uh, polling 12,000 people, 1,000 in 12 countries in developed and developing world, just to get their views on the issues of climate change. One question we posed last year in the fall of last year was how, uh, uh, the, how the world's public views uh, public spending and views public spending on climate change. So about sort of two-thirds in all uh, viewed uh, tackling climate change as about the same or higher priority as a number of uh, sort of very core political issues, which I think was an interesting uh, conclusion from, from the fall of last year. So the results, uh, I hope you can see those. Um, as I said, about 513 billion allocated, uh, the largest amount in, in China. That was the first package that really got off the ground, and I hope uh, we'll hear more, more about that. Uh, also, in, 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 I'd take note of uh, Korea, and obviously here in, in the US. One point to underline, the, the European Union's uh, package uh, in, at a member state level and at a union level has generally been smaller. This is because, obviously, the European Union has a more automatic welfare system, and many of the renewable and clean energy packages are much well better established there. So maybe the, the need for a stimulus, particularly on the green side, is less pronounced. These are our estimates in terms of the percentage of green stimulus uh, using our definitions as, as part of the total fiscal plan. As you can see, uh, Korea comes out at uh, almost 80%. Uh, their whole package has been designed as a, uh, the Global Green New Deal launched last January, and the country is, is passing legislation which will come into force this April, allocating 2% of GMP on their green growth strategy. So a very clear commitment there. Uh, China coming in at about a third, uh, and the U.S. Uh, at about uh, 12%. Uh, interesting to see that South Africa has also been allocating money in, in their uh, budget and stimulus package. In terms of where is the money going, uh, the big area is this big area of energy efficiency, and particularly uh, in terms of buildings, in terms of rail, uh, in terms of uh, grid spending. Renewables, I think, is, we, we were surprised when we did the figures in terms of when you think of green stimulus, you think of lots of money in renewables. Really, that's, that is coming largely out of, out of the U.S., uh, but then uh, other low-carbon areas and, and water infrastructure. So mostly an environmental infrastructure phenomenon. Again, one of the things that I think people we've heard today in discussions about the U.S., but also as a more general phenomenon, is the question of uh, political commitments being made, but actually are these being delivered? And this chart shows our varying estimates through the year, starting in May last year, uh, then August, and then our latest assessment back in November, about the amount of stimulus uh, that has been spent globally. And as you can see, our estimates for 2009 came down from about $135 billion to about $94, uh, which bumped up the, the stimulus uh, spending for this year, which is obviously going to be the big... 
year of delivery, uh, and then slightly bumped up that for 2011. Uh, obviously, there are very different rules around the world in terms of uh, the, the, the allocations and the solidity of allocations, but obviously, as spending gets delayed, the risks, particularly in the time of austerity, is this uh, spending maybe uh, gets, gets caught in the, in the retrenchment process. So, just to wrap up some of the lessons so far. Firstly, public finance can uh, crowd in private capital. I think it's interesting to see the role of the multilateral development banks in Europe. We've seen the role of the European Investment Bank uh, coming into play, and I think the, the role of, of, of public uh, finance institutions in terms of crowding in private capital uh, is important, and I think that has helped to underpin some of the uh, clean energy investment last year. Uh, it has been a national phenomenon. Uh, one of the, the few positive uh, developments, I think, that came out of Copenhagen was the commitment to 30 billion in terms of fast start funding. How can we see that as essentially as a stimulus package for uh, clean energy and low carbon technologies around the world and use that to leverage two, three, four times in terms of private capital? Importantly for us as analysts, but I think also for public accountability as well, is transparency, uh, particularly around regulatory, uh, regular reporting. The US has a, has a very good system, Australia, France, uh, and Canada as well, but many other countries, we don't see the sort of real-time data on, on dispersants that many analysts, including many business people, will need. Uh, we've heard about the issue of, of, of uh, operational efficiency, getting the, the procedures in place to actually disperse uh, uh, quickly, um, and I think therefore we have a, a fear of delay leading to retrenchment. And finally, this question again, which I'd like to hear your thoughts on as well, is uh, how can we make this tr smooth transition from stimulus to recovery? Uh, just one example there, the Major Economies Forum, its Technology Action Plan report, which was uh, launched at the time of Copenhagen, was talking about the need to uh, increase public investment around the world in the Major Economies Forum three to six times to get us onto a low carbon track. Uh, how are we going to be able to do that in a, in a time when uh, public budgets, particularly in the industrialised world, are under severe downward pressure? Many thanks. Great. Thanks, Nick. And I think we're going to go with Ethan next because you've got a presentation as well. Um, one of the critical questions here we've asked Ethan to address is how exactly stimulus spending uh, uh, impacts sort of the private sector and, and leverages private sector funding. So he's going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, hi, th and thanks very much. Um, yeah, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is the important role that the private sector is playing in interacting with the stimulus and also how critical um, the success of the stimulus is um, on how, what private market conditions are right now. Um, just very quickly, for those of you who don't know us, Bloomberg New Energy Finance is a global research firm um, covering clean energy investment worldwide. These are where our offices are. Um, the firm has been around for five years. We were acquired by uh, Bloomberg uh, a couple months ago. Um, and really what we do is track the flow of financing in this sector. Our primary clients are investment banks, uh, venture capital funds, manufacturers in the clean energy sector, a number of government agencies, including the Department of Energy, um, and really our one and only focus is uh, on clean energy and low carbon energy technologies. So, um, you know, five years of gathering data and studying this sector, I will try and sum up in basically one slide um, about what's happening in the clean energy sector at this very moment. Um, in a very rapid uh, period of time, we went from a, a, a moment of, of extraordinary investment and in capital availability in this sector to one where suddenly capital has become uh, more constrained. We've not gone all the way back to where we were in 2004, but we're not where we were in 2008 either. Um, we've gone from a period where there was a very low uh, supply of equipment um, and, and that equipment was fairly high priced um, to one in which suddenly we've got a very high uh, amount of equipment available and falling prices, particularly in the solar sector. Um, inevitably, that meant that manufacturers had a lot of power to dictate prices. Um, now buyers, which in this case means consumers and developers of projects, are in the driver's seat. And we've really gone from a period of sporadic government support for sub via various kinds of subsidies to a much more concentrated and focused effort on this sector. So right now, we really are in an ongoing, as I say, an ongoing recovery and readjustment to new 
difficult uh, and changed conditions, and into this comes the, the stimulus package, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. But in terms of, again, the sector, you know, tracking the money, this is one of the things that we, you know, really do sort of our bread and butter is, as you can see, you've seen the spectacular run up from back in 2004 from about $36 billion all the way up to $155 billion in 2008, and then a bit of a drop off in 2009. Um, this year, we actually do expect the money uh, to come back in, uh, hit about 180 to $200 billion on the year. Um, that is with the very large caveat that we continue to have economic uh, recovery and growth. We're not macroeconomic forecasters, so to some degree that goes out the window if we do a double dip recession here. Uh, but assuming we continue to come back, we think we'll see uh, growth this year. Uh, now, one of the things that I think, you know, an important point to be made about the stimulus, and I'm going to talk about it a lot here, is that um, it's, it's probably the most important supply side uh, uh, policy ever aimed at growing clean energy capacity in the United States. And it's incredibly generous uh, in the amount of money that it's going into the sector. But it has arrived at a moment of sudden oversupply in the marketplace. Um, if right here, this is very recently some research that we put out in which you can see that suddenly in the U.S., after years of being undersupplied with wind turbines, is about to enter into a period of significant oversupply. Um, the bars demonstrate the amount of supplied, uh, uh, excuse me, thousands of megawatts of supplied turbines. Um, the lines indicate the demand that we project out. We have both a bull and a bear scenario over the next couple of years. But you'll notice that even in our bull, bullish scenario, the amount of turbines that are going to be built in the United States is more than are going to be needed here in the U.S. So those things have to find a home someplace. Uh, and turbine makers are going to either try and send them to South America where there's growing interest or other markets, um, or they're going to hope that here in the U.S. we start to have more demand. Uh, and at the same time, that's been coupled with a uh, capital undersupply suddenly. Um, one of the things that we noted in, as we broke the numbers down this year uh, was that for the first, you know, we, we sort of, we grouped the, the world into three segments. There's Europe, Middle East, and Africa, EMEA. There's the Americas, and there's the Asia and Oceania region. And as you can see, um, this was really the first year that the Asia region jumped ahead of the Americas region in terms of investment in clean energy. Um, so we've seen a drop off in available capital uh, in the U.S. I mean, this covers South America as well, but most of this money has been, been up here that took place last year. So suddenly we have oversupply of equipment and an undersupply of capital and in comes the stimulus. In terms of where renewables, and this is one last piece of the puzzle here, in terms of where renewables, um, you know, fit within compared to conventional power, um, you know, I think it's important to remember that they are still much more expensive um, on an unsubsidized basis than coal and natural gas. Um, you know, we are analysts of the industry. We're not, you know, promoters of the industry. So I think it's important to take stock of this. One thing we do every quarter is we look at the so-called levelized cost of energy, which is how much a typical contract that a developer has to sign with a utility to make a 10 percent return on investment on a project. Uh, and one of the things that we've noted, and as you look through the list here, you'll see, you'll see coal and natural gas down near the bottom of the list. Um, you can see the various clean energy technologies stacked up all the way up. Um, one thing that we've noticed is that um, while equipment prices have been coming down very nicely, um, the cost of capital has not been coming down or it's been going up in a number of cases. And so these two things offset each other and you've not seen a dramatic uh, decrease in the, the levelized cost of energy uh, for developers. So again, about the ARRA, as I said, most important uh, federal clean energy legislation in history. Uh, by our calculation, $66, $67 billion for DOE, DOD, GSA, uh, Treasury money. We only are counting clean energy. We're not counting rail. We're not counting water, just clean energy. Um, and I think it's important, though, to note that many of these components of the money getting actually out the door are contingent on the private sector. So you have grants that are contingent on parties raising some independent money for their project. You've got loan guarantees where a bank has to come in and provide some of the debt as well. You've got tax credits um, where sometimes third-party uh, third tax equity investors are needed. Uh, and so thus, the success is contingent on f private fundraising conditions. Um, and uh, in this case, for, for uh, tech firms, it's venture capital availability. For uh, companies that uh, do manufacturing, it's typically um, public market funds, such as stock exchange raises via IPOs and other things like that. And for projects, it's debt capital. Um, and I would say there's been some successes to date, but there's still plenty, uh, plenty left to, to be proven here. 
Uh, our calculations on how much money's gone out the door, uh, you know, David mentioned $31 billion um, is what we say has been allocated, leaving about another $35 billion left to go in terms of <laughs> allocation. But our view is that, you know, our clients want to know how much money literally has hit the street. You know, it's nice that you could talk about how it's been allocated and how maybe you've assigned it to go to this state or that state, but how much money has actually gone into the marketplace? I would, our estimate is somewhere in the range of no more than five to $10 billion has actually gone into the marketplace at this point. Um, now, that's not a criticism. I think, you know, in many sense, the DOE has moved at sort of light speed by government standards to get this money um, out the door. But the reality of it is in terms of how much money is in the market and cir circulating somewhere in the neighborhood of five to ten, um, but the impact the stimulus has had has been very dramatic and very positive. I don't mean to underplay that, but in terms of actual dollars, it's not as big as some of the numbers we may have heard so far. Quickly, a couple of sort of success stories, um, you know, in terms of the way I think that this was all supposed to work. Um, Solyndra is a company based in California. Um, they make long cylindrical um, PV modules. Um, they raised $600 million in 2008. Um, and then in 2009, they were offered the DOE's first loan guarantee. Um, and then uh, having finalized that about six months later, they raised about $200 million more in private equity, which was based on the fact that they had been able to get this, this loan guarantee. And then now they're shooting for an IPO, I believe, on NASDAQ for $300 million. So this is a case where they've leveraged that government support, they got some private capital, and now they're going to go for some public capital. And this is sort of the virtuous circle, as it, I think, is supposed to be working. Similar story that David told about A123 systems, I won't go through it since he talked about it in great, deal, but great detail, but I mean, basically, that's another very good example of where this has played very well. <clears throat> and again, I, I guess I would call this sort of the... Uh, sort of the virtuous Ferris wheel or, or circle or lollipop of, uh, of uh, DOE involvement in the electric vehicle sector. And I, I only put this up to sort of highlight the fact that we focus very much on the money going out the door from DOE, but money goes out the door from DOE and then one company makes an investment in another company or one company um, starts and signs a supply contract with another company. So what you can see here, are these dot, various dotted lines to the center of the pinwheel uh, is money either dispersed or promised to one of these various companies in the electric vehicle sector. Um, and then on the outside, you see Treasury and its support for GM, but you also see a $370 million, million dollar IPO for A123 systems. You see $92 million that Fisker Automotive, an electric vehicle maker, raised. And then you see a number of these sort of white arrows, which are the supply agreements and investments that have taken place between these various companies. So there's an ecosystem of electric vehicle companies out there, battery makers, control systems, and others, and the DOE is playing a critical role in supporting them, although not always directly in the way that gets documented through, through uh, stimulus grants. And finally, though, just to reiterate some of the points I think I've sort of made along the way, um, in the most basic sense, renewables are not competitive yet. Um, with fossil fuels. Solar is moving very quickly in that direction, and we predict maybe as soon as a year from now, it will be there in some markets. It's really contingent on electricity prices and a number of other factors. But it's, they're not there yet. And insofar as they're not there yet, you have to find a way to sort of bridge the gap, if that is your long-term goal. Um, the ARRA was entirely focused on the supply of clean energy goods and projects. Um, this is not... Um, a criticism. It's just the, the political realities was that this is where money was intended to come in. Um, but it is now arriving and being dispersed in an oversupplied marketplace uh, in which supply side policies really are only going to be so useful. Um, and so what could imp up, uh, the ARRA's impact? Well, obviously, um, if the economy suddenly comes roaring back to life and a lot more capital is available, then these companies that need uh, to take advantage of their grants by raising money from venture capital are going to have more capital available. Some of the bigger guys who need to raise money to build their manufacturing plants are going to be able to IPO. All kinds of good things are going to happen if the economy keeps rebounding. If that doesn't happen, um, which is a distinct possibility, um, or even if it does happen, the other thing that the government could do and probably should do in our view if they really want to sort of set this market on fire is to create a demand side policy that supports the clean energy sector. And there's some talk of carbon cap and trade. Um, obviously that would be helpful to the sector, but our view is much more helpful would be a national renewable electricity standard, which Congress uh, is again contemplating at this moment, and we can certainly talk more about. But if you couple the very strong su supply side policies that you've had with a significant demand side policy, again, I think you would see 
uh, very, very strong growth in the U.S., and you would make major strides towards that clean energy economy that the administration talks so much about. But until those two things happen, you're going to have some problems along the way. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Ethan. Next, we've asked Julian to come in and ask, uh, answer sort of the real easy question, which is uh, uh, what's going on in China? Uh, China has a really uh, very large stimulus program, um, and everyone up here has sort of been able to write about it at some point, uh, talking about what they do know and don't know. We asked Julian to really kind of dig in and figure out what, what we are able to know and not able to know about how China is spending their green stimulus, how they define it, what their priorities are, things like that. Um, and having done some research in the area, this is not uh, an easy question to answer. So we're really looking forward to what you have to say, Julian. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for uh, hosting this event, inviting me to, to share these remarks. And uh, thanks to CSIS as well. Um, so I think what I'm going to do today is talk about, first lay out what we do know about China's stimulus package uh, and what we do know about the green components of it. Um, and, and then sort of try to... I will, I will sort of present the argument that, you know, it's really hard to, I guess the first caveat is that um, there isn't a recovery.gov.cn website <laughs> that really tracks in a transparent manner what's going on. I wish there were. So that's the biggest challenge, is trying to figure out, uh, as Ethan said, what, what, what money is hitting the street in, in, in China, uh, both in the, in the terms of the broader stimulus package and also in terms of the green components. Um, I will argue that um, the, green, the stimulus package is not as green as uh, many press reports have covered, covered it, but uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's a lot of things going on outside the November 08 um, fiscal stimulus package. There's a lot of things going on in monetary stimulus that are green. So on one hand, it's not as green as it looks, but on the other hand, if you look at a bigger picture, there's, it is greener. So, and then just sort of like bring it back to the home, uh, bring it back to the U.S. And, and, and sort of like draw a few lessons that we can learn and take back. Um, but I think the, the foremost important thing to, to, to realize is that, make no mistake about it, China is going into clean energy in a major way. Um, it's, it's just that it's doing it in a variety of mechanisms that are difficult to track. So what do we know about the stimulus package in China? Uh, the fiscal stimulus package was announced in November of 2008. Um, it was 586 billion U.S. dollars, um, but the, the thing to note is that um, the central government only committed to fund about 27% of that 586 billion. The assumption was that the remainder would be funded by subnational governments, provincial governments, municipal governments, uh, along with the private sector. So. So really, the, the, the commitment from the central government is a lot smaller than, uh, than the, the large headline number would suggest. Um, and the OECD you know, suggests that actually the private sector component of it is, is especially large, um, as large as um, probably um, you know, two-thirds of it. Um, and what's interesting about that is um, these companies are not um, investing uh, and contributing to stimulus through retained earnings, but rather it's through bank lending, so loans that they take out from banks. So this is where the monetary policy is important. So I'll talk a little bit more, more about that um, in, in just a bit. Um, a, another interesting development over the course of the year was the change in allocations. So initially, um, there, there are three potential uh, components that are potentially green. And the first is sustainable development. There was a part, of, part called sustainable development where nine, initially the initial allocation was 9% of this $586 billion. Uh, in March of 2009, that got reduced to 5%. Um, and then there's this infra infrastructure part, which is probably the biggest component of the whole Chinese stimulus package. And in, the initial allocation was 45%, and that got reduced slightly to 38% in March of 2009. Uh, and then there's a third um, component, which is a little more cryptic, uh, it's called technology advances and industry restructuring. So to the extent that there's innovation in, in clean energy technologies, energy efficiency, to the extent that you, you know, these stimulus, this stimulus money affects a structural industry restructuring from heavy industry to light industry, one could you know, consider that green stimulus. But it's really hard to unpack and know where the money is going. But the initial allocation for that in November 08 was 4%, and that got increased. Uh, more than doubled to 9% in March of 2009. So 
So, and uh, you know, a, th a third thing to mention about what we know about the stimulus package is that um, there's, there's been some debate about how much of this 586 billion truly represents new pro uh, stimulus programs versus programs that existed but just, were just repackaged um, by the central government um, to provide a market signal that the government was taking the recession seriously. Um, because, you know, I think, but I think the broader point is that if you want to think about it, um, really, if you think about China's trajectory and its economic growth, isn't it, wouldn't we say that it's done a 30-year stimulus plan um, since 1979, since it decided to open up its economy? Um, and so, and I think what we're seeing in clean energy, too, is it's not a result of just st the stimulus package alone. It, it is a result of a, a long-term investment plan. You know, they, they have a medium to long-term plan that stretches to 2020 and from what I understand, the, the newly formed National Energy Commission is in, in the process of, of rethinking and extending that, that long-term goal to 2030. Um, so let's dig a little deeper into these few components that I talked about. Um, infrastructure is the biggest portion. And when we talk about infrastructure, um, what this includes is everything from highway construction uh, to to grid construction, uh, grid build-outs, which is essential if you're talking about um, delivering clean energy electrons from remote sources to the cities. Uh, and China happens to lead the world in terms of ultra-high voltage technology. Uh, and so that's, that's something to know. It also includes things like rail, uh, which you, know, you could subdivide in terms of uh, freight rail or high-speed rail. Um, and, you know, and it's such an amazing story in terms of rail in China. Um, China is about to spend about a projected $300 billion uh, till 2020 to really build out one, you know, essentially the world's largest network of high-speed rail. And already, you know, se several phases of these um, uh, high-speed rail infrastructure have opened, um, and if, if anyone has had the opportunity to take them, they're, they're truly state-of-the-art. Um, but at the same time, it also includes freight rail. So, you know, and, that, and that, a lot of that is really dedicated to transporting coal. From, from place to place. So, you know, squaring the high-speed rail, which is mass transit, which is which one can certainly think of as green, versus um, freight rail that tr uh, transports coal. Um, you know, how do you square that? Uh, and no one really has the numbers to how that is divvied up. Um, and then, money is also spent uh, in the sustainable development part uh, to things like energy conservation, um, which is important because energy efficiency is a major push of the government in terms of its energy policy. has also spent on waste disposal, waste management, uh, and also spent uh, on water, water efficiency, water saving conservation. Uh, and, and finally, ecological restoration, things like soil, rehabil re soil rehabilitation, uh, reforestry programs, and such. Uh, the notable thing is that no money has been allocated to renewable t uh, energy or renewable energy projects, uh, at least in the fiscal stimulus. And I think the answer to that is that a lot of the funding uh, for renewable energy projects is really coming from the banks. And this is where I, I talked about earlier that, uh, you know, apart from this fiscal stimulus, there's this whole other world of mo um, monetary stimulus, bank lending stimulus. And the size of that is actually quite large indeed. Um, by some estimates, in 2009, uh, new loans uh, totaled to 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars, which is truly, you know, out, you know Remarkable, considering that the GDP of China was about four and a half trillion, so one third, and and that really has been, you know, it's been quite a um, present topic in, in in Chinese economic policy as of late. Um, there's been a lot of concerns that we are entering uh, a potentially dangerous inflationary period, uh, and that uh, and that has prompted the, the central bank to increase reserve ratios and to really to to sort of tighten up monetary policies uh, uh, a bit. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in terms of clean energy financing, and especially in terms of those large-scale wind projects and solar projects. Um, and I think, you know, so I sort of entered a section where, you know, I sort of titled here, All the Glitters is Not Green. Um, and, and so I alluded to some of this earlier, just in terms of how do you square, you know, how do you really break down the real investments, like what's green and what's not. Uh, and certainly one can think of green, green investments, like I said, as, as an essential part of a clean energy economy, but you know, whether it's grid, whether it's rail, they all take enormous amounts of cement and steel, 
And if you really want to do, to do a true uh, life cycle accounting of, of the kind of fixed asset investments uh, that is being put into place, and really accounting for the embedded carbon, I think you get a slightly different picture. So what, I guess essentially what I'm suggesting is that to, to take into account the investments that are overtly labeled as green versus those that are not. Um, and, and, and make no mistake about it, this has been a lot of investments. You know, re recall this, the earthquakes in Sichuan uh, uh, two years ago. Like uh, one quarter of the $586 billion was, was allocated to rebuilding Sichuan. And so that's a lot of uh, building reconstruction. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that um, I would be surprised if uh, any, uh, any significant proportion of those projects were, you know, would survive um, uh, the sort of env rigorous environmental impact assessments that the government has promised it, ha it would undertake. In fact, this has been a tussle. Uh, in fact, the Ministry of Env uh, Environmental Protection uh, came out early in the, in the stimulus process saying that, you know, we won't approve projects that are, that are you know, high in pollution uh, and, and high in energy consumption. Um, but you know, when the numbers shaked out, it, they, you know, they were essentially only turning down one-tenth of uh, infra large-scale infrastructure projects. And the fact of the matter is heavy industry, uh, particularly uh, steel and cement uh, industries, benefited a lot from the stimulus package uh, in a way that suggests that really the, the, the environmental ministry's power to enforce its environmental impact assessments were, was, was limited, or at least a, or maybe a decision was made uh, internally to sort of turn that, that process, tone that process down a little bit. Um, so, you know, and, and, and like I said, the, the investments in the highways, so, you know, the other story is that China is now the largest auto market in the world, uh, and it's really only getting started, which is the scary thing. And, 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 you know, for all we talk about the ability of developing countries to leapfrog the West in developing a new carbon future, um, I think what we're seeing in China is, suggests that there's a lot more work to be done uh, because at least when it comes to transportation, uh, it is repeating the mistakes of the West. And, and that is something that, quite frankly, um, planners will have, have grappled with and continue to grapple with um, in terms of their energy policy. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the bank financing. And, and really, this is one of the distingu distinguishing features of China's stimulus compared to U.S., uh, whereas in the U.S., what happened in the wake of the crisis is that no banks were willing to lend uh, because of the unique stru political structure of China and because all the major banks are owned by the government. Um, when the government decided to, to, to intervene in the economy, it really opened the spigots for financing. And so uh, it became basically a more important element of China's stimulus than was the announced fiscal stimulus. But... You know, I don't want to sound to be too down on, on China's um, sort of like green agenda because in actual fact, um, they are undertaking a very uh, profound and committed uh, uh, undertaking to, to develop a clean energy industry. It is, you know, it's going to be a pillar industry, named as a pillar industry for the next five-year plan. Uh, they see it as a strategic uh, industry, not just in terms of uh, economic growth and technology development, but certainly for national security and energy, energy security reasons. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot written about the, the really lofty renewable energy and energy efficiency targets in China. Um, and I won't talk about that, but surely all that is driving, sending the right market signals to industry and to investors, uh, and that is driving a lot of growth in the sector. Um, and most recently, of course, as, as a result of the Copenhagen process, 40, you know, uh, China committed to a 40 to 45 percent reduction in carbon uh, emissions uh, as a per unit of economic output. Uh, an analysis by Renmin University, which is one of the more prominent universities in China, uh, suggested that to meet that goal, China would have to invest $30 billion per year for the next 10 years. Um, and, you know, China is really investing across the whole value chain of, of the energy industry. Uh, so it's not just, whereas we, can, we tend to think that China's prowess in, in the clean energy space is as a result of the manufacturing, uh, uh, you know, the ability to, to, to manufacture at such a rapid rate and, and productive rate. While that is true, um, China realizes that that alone won't get uh, fully develop the clean energy industry. So as a result, they're investing a lot in deployment, setting the standards that would send the right signals to the market, and also increasingly the investing in the innovation aspect of it. 
something that is not a traditional strength uh, of, of, of mod, mod, the history of science and technology, in modern China at least. Um, and so they have national programs called the 863 program, the 973 program, where the energy sector, particularly new and renewable energy, is, is a target industry for development. Um, and there was a new scientist um, article a few weeks ago that sort of highlighted China's new role in a uh, new emphasis in science and technology, um, talking about how now that Chinese basically leads the world in terms of number of scientific journal articles published, um, and increasingly as well, the number of patents being filed uh, is on the rise as well. Um, so, another aspect of, of you know, one fi a couple of final points. Um, you know, it's been clear through, particularly through the lending um, activities from the banks. Uh, you know, a majority of this lending just goes to state-owned enterprises, and they are another major vehicle of China's clean energy story. Um, and, and it's something that is unique to China um, and a lot of East Asian economies. Uh, you, know, a, you know, one, one notable entity worth, worth pointing out is called the China Energy Conservation Investment Corporation, or CESIC. Uh, this is a company, a state-owned company, that has about 180 subsidiaries and more than 11,000 employees. Uh, and they, they invest in, across the full range of uh, clean energy um, technologies and energy efficiency technologies. And more recently, and they're going really big on solar. They're partnering with SunTech, which is by now the world's largest uh, solar manufacturer. It's a Chinese company. Um, to build projects across China. And also now they're venturing to seek uh, projects in Europe. So they're going global in a big way. Um, looking forward to the 12 five-year plan and beyond, uh, there's talk of a new package, particularly for new energy and renewable energy. Um, media reports last year suggested a 10-year plan of investments of $440 billion to $660 billion. Now, that hasn't quite transpired uh, for reasons that no one, no one is quite sure. I, su I suspect that a lot of this, the shakeout of the, the recession and, and the implementation of the stimulus pro uh, process uh, probably um, painted uh, or provided um, some reason for caution in terms of announcing a, a package of that nature. But I expect that uh, some, you know, somewhere within the next year, we would expect a new, target, new renew renewable energy targets and a major a strategy going forward for the next two decades, really, on, on how China will chart its cost in clean energy. To summarize, I think, um, and to conclude, I think what we know about China China's fiscal stimulus package is that, um, you know, it, it, is, it is helpful in providing a jump start to certain sustainable development sectors, but because there are competing priorities, um, the fiscal stimulus uh, package by itself uh, may have limited effect. I think what's more interesting in China's case is its long-term sustained policy, uh, both in terms of its monetary policy, but also in terms of its strategic long-term um, development, development plans. Um, and, you know, I think the lesson in this case for, for the U.S. is pretty clear, as uh, the Assistant Secretary stated earlier. Um, you know, ARA provides a good jump start in, in green development in the United States, but it doesn't take us to the promised land, and I think we've seen that borne out in, in China as well. And what we need in the U.S. is a more comprehensive approach rather than just uh, two-year temporary measures. And, and to get um, the cost of production correct. Um, and in this case, it means, you know, among other things, putting a price in carbon in the United States. So with that, um, I'm, I, I thank you for your time, and I look forward to questions later on. Thanks, Julian. Our final speaker is Kevin Book, and we, uh, Kevin's got the fun job of uh, coming up. We asked him to talk a little bit about so when you think about the stimulus and how it's been laid out as part of this grand strategy for starting a sort of uh, Green New Deal, green energy revolution, um, how do we gauge success for a lot of these disparate policies? And are there sort of inherent contradictions within not only the strategies themselves, but the implementation uh, and some of the programs that we've seen thus far? So Kevin, up to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, CSIS, for having me. Uh, I guess uh, as batting cleanup, part of the job is to ask questions about the first 
four presenters, uh, and uh, I want to defer to, I, I think, an a extraordinary breadth of, of material. Uh, I'm going to focus essentially on, on three challenges, trade implications associated with a deleveraging world. Uh, I'm going to talk about efficiency as the enemy of that which is clean and green, and uh, a little bit about maybe a spoiler for clean and green investment known as nuclear power. Uh, Clearview Energy Partners is a research and consulting firm. We, we don't look at everything. Uh, there are firms that do that very well, several of them represented here on this panel. Uh, we look at the things that tend to be game changers. Uh, and so uh, the nature of this presentation will follow from that. The, uh, the, the OECD stimulus programs basically break down to spending, uh, spending tomorrow's money on yesterday's factories for today's workers. And so this brings us to something of a protectionist problem. Uh, generally speaking, though, uh, stimulus programs are effective. Uh, I'm sure I surprise no one when I say that there's a very strong positive correlation between jobs and GDP. Yes, that's right. Uh, especially here in the US, it's almost perfect. Uh, and so if you look at what the jobs numbers implied about GDP in third quarter, uh, they implied a 0.4% uh, gain. It was 2.2%. Uh, in fourth quarter, a zero, uh, negative 0.2% uh, uh, loss, uh, and it was 5.7% positive. Stimulus works. Uh, it, clearly, it may not stimulate jobs, and there's, a, there's an implication. Uh, the, the, the real question is whether or not these sorts of protectionist outgrowths of spending on your own economy block trade that might long-term be a road to faster recovery. Uh, and uh, we're not there yet, so this is sort of a look ahead, certainly not a, not a, a prediction so much as a, a what if. Uh, in the post-Copenhagen carbon compliance world, there is a question. If, if global federalism didn't deliver us into a post-Kyoto uh, single treaty world, is trade and tariff-based compliance where we're going to go? Are we going to tax other countries' stuff? Are we going to penalize other countries for the way they behave by taxing non-energy stuff? Big question. Um, the lack of access to credit has affected the energy end user in a way that I think isn't well appreciated yet. The, uh, the demand recovery here in the U.S., if you look at this, this recovery, and we're looking at jobs now relative to energy, is about 15% flatter. So the number of BTUs consumed on average per new job recovered in the economy, 15% flatter than the last recovery. Why? Our, our hypothesis is that the end user of energy in this com in country, and in, in the OCD in general, is having a harder time borrowing. It's making it harder to, to use more energy discretionarily. So what you have in this, this protectionist question is, nations are now competing for a smaller global market, at least temporarily, uh, and a less fulfilling pie if the curve grows. Uh, so what can we see? Let's end theory. The ITCs in this country are for an origin agnostic solar product. The PTCs are for origin agnostic wind products. But you heard today David Sandelow talk about extending the manufacturing credit for stuff that's made here. Is this a bellwether of, of perhaps policy changes to come? Uh, $2 billion of conventional renewable spending, which was origin agnostic, was devoted to U.S. automakers in the Clunkers program. Uh, again, it's not yet clear whether we are decisively changing anything. Uh, whether it's a blip or a trend, but it could be an early sign. Uh, the next, uh, next spoiler I promised was efficiency the enemy. Uh, and I don't want to be cavalier about this because uh, there are some well-demonstrated efficiency gains in, in global, uh, global performance that we will never get to here in the United States. Germany's reduced the, energy, uh, the electricity demand in buildings from 150 kilowatt hours per square meter per year to 30. Uh, it's not likely that Americans and, and in our building stock, our lifestyles will ever get there. On the other hand, uh, when you look at what the market size looks like, power demand is likely to recover and grow if, you, if more slowly. Fuels are likely in the OECD to flatten, and, and here in the U.S., CAFE standards could make them decline. So this is where you get into some of the conflicts of your efficiency gains and your new green technologies. And, and I think Ethan put it very well. There's a, a significant oversupply because the government bought a lot of stuff that the private market wasn't, and it's now out there. That capacity exists. So what does it look like if demand is weaker than expected? Um, natural gas is the first thing I think that provides uh, some context. Fracking here and in Europe uh, could potentially bring not only an abundance of local gas, but also extra LNG, and gas prices could stay low for a long time. Obviously, that will have impacts, potentially, on the, on the profitability on the demand side of these green investments without a carbon price. Uh, power demand fell 3.76% in 08. Uh, it's estimated about one and uh, a quarter percent last year. Uh, electric power margins are not 
a driver necessarily for some of these higher priced read green investments. So again, the environment in, into which, and then I think Ethan said it very aptly, into which the supply has been brought as one of weaker demand naturally. And here's the bomb waiting to go off. And it's actually, I think, one of the greatest success stories of the stimulus package. There is a genuine market failure in low income homes. They don't need you know, motion sensing lights. They don't need programmable thermostats. They know where the light switch and they, is and they know where the thermostat is. They've been off all year. What they need is insulation in the walls. Okay, well, what happens if you insulate buildings that never would have been insulated as a function of economic demand response? You shift the curve down a little bit. And so it might not be a lot, but if we get 650,000 homes, which is more than our estimate, uh, you could destroy as much as 1% of electric power demand permanently here in the US. Again, it's a good thing, but it makes it harder to be green. The Homestar program that's been discussed, six billion in spend this year, might move a lot faster than the energy uh, offices at the state level, which are still choking on a massive influx of new dollars. Uh, we think that money gets out eventually. Homestar could ride on top of that, another one, one percent, one and a half percent. Let's talk about cafe standards. Another success, not necessarily explicitly linked to the stimulus package, but certainly supported it in the long term by electric vehicles investments. Uh, it's just that if you have a 40 mile per gallon car, the cost case for an electric vehicle at today's technology levels, today's subsidy levels, isn't there. You come up $3,000 short over a seven year vehicle life at $80 oil. On the other hand, if you have a 20 mile per gallon car, a battery powered electric vehicle with a $7,500 subsidy, you're two grand ahead at the end of the whole thing. Uh, it, it, this is one of the challenges. As we make the fleet more efficient, we're raising the bar for competition from some of these portfolio shifting electric vehicles. Renewable fuel standards, uh, again, not explicitly stimulus, but something to think about. New ethanol replaces 8.5% of gasoline demand in 2020 by our numbers. If all the advanced biofuels come from biodiesel, it's about another 9% of diesel demand uh, in, in 2020 and taking a very small Pickens plan projection. So wake up, America. Uh, we're not going all the way to every truck. It's not going to happen. Okay, it, if it were just half of 18 wheelers that move point to point and have relatively defined refueling locations, we're talking about about 20% of distillate demand. Okay, so first of all, it's bad to be a refiner, but that's not what we're here to talk about. The question is, what does it mean for the green stimulus in this context where you have now got a manufacturing problem? Three parts gasoline, two parts middle distillates, and one part products come out of your refinery, and you've just cut the three part by about 10% and the two part by about 30%. You have, you're already awash in distillate fuels. Now you have even more. Globally, not just here in the US, as they proliferate through the world, do they undermine some of the cost case for electric vehicles? Last one, renewable portfolio standards. Uh, if you keep coal constant, which is what the Waxman-Markey bill effectively said to do over 10 years, and you allow renewables to cut into the generation uh, mix when it's not growing, you're displacing something. On a one-to-one -one displacement for gas, you could change the, the peak gas demand, it was about seven TCF in 2007, to as little as five and a half TCF in, in 2020, uh, if you got everything that the Waxman market went for and you replaced all gas with renewables, which isn't real. Uh, or about 6.5 TCF uh, in the Senate bill. This is a decline and the question is, is this the greenest outcome you might get? And uh, again, when we go back to the broader question of carbon pricing and demand drivers, which I think is still very much the elephant in the room, here's the deal. If green replaces gas one to one and coal stays burning, then emissions are up by our models about 2.3% in 2020 versus 2012 and about 13% in 2030 versus 2012. Again, theoretical extreme. If gas comes in with green and displaces everything else, so RPS has come true uh, on a state level or a national level, they're almost the same number, and gas fills up the incremental power demand, we're flat versus 2012 in, uh, in, about, uh, in 2020, and we're up about 6% in 2030 on emissions. So interesting question with gas. Last thing, and this is very short. Uh, yesterday, the president announced $8 billion in, in nuclear power loan guarantees. And I think everyone should be asking the question, is this where clean goes? Uh, yesterday, Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said, no, not here. Uh, in Germany, they are mothballing 30% of their generating fleet, which is clean and nuclear powered, 17 reactors. If that changes, 
and German sentiment changes, perhaps it changes everywhere. The question is, if you have an abundance of available nuclear power, microgeneration, small reactors, whatever it might be, does it displace the economic case even with demand supports for renewable power? Will the story change? Uh, we are seeing already equity subsidy fatigue in countries like Germany and Spain, who've paid out an awful lot. We have now just, uh, the numbers we got this morning in our stimulus and implied 2.3 billion spent in, in grants, tax credits as grants so far. Okay, that's a lot of money. Uh, it's, not, it's not Germany or Spain a lot, but it's a lot. Are we moving towards a world where we look at debt subsidies, loan guarantees, as a way to sort of insulate the, first of all, the politicians who are making the choice, but also the governments themselves uh, uh, from the perception that they are merely spending on something rather than investing in something. Uh, and so, uh, you know, to close, green stimulus, uh, however you quantify it, and I, I learned a lot today. I mean, the, these numbers are spectacular no matter how you slice them, no matter how precisely you slice them, and, and trying to divine uh, what the, the China's uh, natural uh, resources uh, department decides to tell you and figure out what it really means is an almost impossible task, Julian, you have my utmost respect. Uh, globally trying to figure out all these stimulus programs, Nick has done a tremendous job and Ethan has quantified, I think, uh, beyond the, the can of any of, of, of his competitors, uh, exactly what we're talking about here in, in total spend. The question is, does any of this work if you have demand conditions that because of either efficiency, an abundance of natural gas, uh, policy choice to back nuclear power undermine this wonderful new supply that's been created? I don't know the answer, but I look forward to uh, comments that might produce it. Thanks. Great. Well, see, I told you that was the fun job. Um, we have got about a half hour left for